Loading, loading, and we're good. Hello, and welcome to this second season of Online Talks. It appears that worldwide we may have to get used to this format talk for a little while longer. So for the upcoming academic year, we aim to organize bi-weekly seminars hosted either by us, the CISAC Vision Group. Hello, and welcome to this second season of Online Talks. It appears that worldwide these ongoing have... talks are still part of the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. As you may have seen, the number of participants increased quite a bit, so there is usually more than one talk every day organized on this common platform, which cover most neuroscience field. I can only recommend you to take a look at the upcoming talks or subscribe to the mailing list so you will not miss any topic you might be interested in. You will find all relevant information in the description below. So back to us. My name is Maxim, and I'm part of Tom Baden's lab at the University of Sussex. Today, I'm very glad to receive our colleague and neighbor, as a lab that just separated by fly stairs, Leon Lagnado. Leon is a professor of neuroscience at the University of Sussex. He did his PhD with Peter McNaughton at the University of Cambridge, and then worked as a postdoc in the laboratory of Dennis Baylor at Stanford University. He then came back to Cambridge and worked for 20 years as a group leader at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology. Now he has moved south to Brighton to the Center for Research on Perception and Cognition, at the University of Sussex, where his research focuses on understanding how the synaptic machinery of the retina contributes to the processing of visual signals. Good afternoon, Leon. Hi. Okay, so uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I've not done a Zoom uh, seminar before, so I hope this goes okay. Um, uh, let me, first of all, get the right screen. Right, so, um, uh, as Maxine mentioned, we're interested in the function of the visual system in general and uh, the retinal circuitry in particular. And um, over a couple of decades or more, we've been particularly interested in the contribution of synapses to the computations that the retina carries out. And what I'd like to do in this talk is give three uh, uh, examples of how the plasticity of synapses contributes to the plasticity of the computations that the retinal circuitry as a whole uh, carries out. Um, now, I suspect most of you are very familiar with the uh, 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 landscape in which I'll be talking uh, uh, the retina, uh, but I'll just quickly run through some basics for those of you who might not be. Um, um, well, I would try to, right, ah, here we go. Okay, so here's a, a, an example of a, a zebrafish retina. And we can think of the signals flowing through the circuitry as straight through signals, the excitatory uh, uh, signals, uh, photoreceptors to bipolar cells through glutamatergic synapse and bipolar cell to ganglion cell. Um, most of the computations that um, we think of such as the generation of center surround receptive fields, uh, contrast adaptation, detection of motion, uh, a, a signaling of object orientation, um, and the uh, variations in those computations are processes that go on in the inner retina, the inner plexiform layer where bipolar cells transmit to ganglion cells and where this transmission is modulated by inhibitory interneurons uh, the amacrine cells. And we'll be looking at how the interactions between inhibitory neurons and uh, the synapses of bipolar cells modulate signal flow uh, through the circuitry. And I'm going to be uh, talking about the plasticity of the retinal circuitry in, in three general contexts. Thinking of plasticity, first of all, as a simple change in gain. And then secondly, uh, as changes in the tuning of neurons. That's to say, what is what feature of the stimulus are they uh, responding to optimally? And I'm going to show uh, uh, an example of where ganglion scales can be retuned to optimally single signal objects of different orientations. And then lastly, I'll be thinking about adaptation as retuning again, but in this time, uh, this time retuning not of the neuron as a whole, but of individual synapses. And I'm going to show you how synapses of bipolar cells can be tuned between the on and off polarities, something that was uh, very surprising to us. And I'll be describing the mechanisms of that and potential um, 
a context in which uh, retuning of synapses between on and off channels might operate. Okay, so let's first of all think about adaptation as changes in game. Um, uh, the visual system adapts to different features of the visual stimulus. It adapts to the mean luminance, for instance, that's processes and photoreceptors, but it also adapts to variations in luminance, as we know, contrast. So here's an example of a visual scene in the blue square uh, and in the green square, the mean luminance doesn't vary as a function of time as we scan those aspects of the scene, but the contrast is higher in the green square compared to the uh, uh, blue square. And it turns out that the visual system adapts to contrast and that adaptation begins uh, in the retinal circuitry. Um, and here's an example of how we set about looking at adaptation uh, to contrast um, using an imaging approach. So uh, uh, all the, uh, most of the experiments I'll be describing use imaging as the fundamental experimental uh, approach. So here uh, we've got uh, the retina of a larval zebrafish. So we use zebrafish for our research because they've got beautiful big retinas. You can see a larval zebrafish here. Uh, they're relatively see-through. We can put them under a multi-photo microscope and image uh, uh, different types of neurons that we can target genetically. And here we're targeting the output neurons, the retinal ganglion cells. And we're looking at their activity simply with a calcium reporter, uh, a GCAP uh, calcium reporter. And here's some examples of outputs from the three different retinal ganglion cells. Um, initially, when we uh, just apply a step of light from darkness, you can see a strong response. And uh, uh, the all three adapt to some degree. So that's just adaptation to luminance. We now apply a high contrast stimulus, in this case at 10 hertz. You can see this bottom ganglion cell doesn't much care about uh, temporal contrast. Its response is pretty well sustained. And at the top here, we see uh, uh, what's been classically described uh, over several decades, a ganglion cell which initially responds strongly to the increase in contrast and then adapts as a decrease in gain. So adaptation as a decrease in gain is something that we've all read about in the textbooks and the basic idea or thinking is that uh, it's helpful to sensory systems because it prevents saturation. It readjusts the gain so that if the contrast should increase again at some point in the future, there's still some dynamic range with which to signal that increase in contrast. But what we also found is a uh, third type of ganglion cell, which initially responds very weakly to temporal contrast, but then gradually sensitizes. So this is a form of adaptation where the gain change is now in the opposite direction. The neuron is initially not terribly sensitive to contrast and then gradually sensitizes. Okay, so uh, we're particularly interested in getting into the circuitry, within, into the black box to understand how these input-output relations arise from uh, uh, the neurons and the synapses within the circuitry. So I'll give you a, a quick run through now of how we disentangled what was happening here. Okay, so we began to look at synapses uh, in the retina um, using a reporter called SciFi, which is based on Giro Miesebox fluorin, uh, um, a GFP set of a pH sensitive GFP, which is fused to a synaptic uh, vesicle protein. Um, an example of the kind of signals you can see with sci-fi as shown here. So here we've targeted uh, the report of the synapses of uh, bipolar cells using a ribeye promoter. And we can uh, apply uh, luminances, different luminances here. And you can see some synapses get brighter. These are on synapses. Some get dimmer. These are off synapses. And so we're looking at vesicle release here uh, uh, using what is actually a very suboptimal reporter. <laughs> uh, we could do much better uh, uh, to directly image uh, synaptic transmission, and I'll get to that later in the talk. But at the time, that was the best we could do. But we uh, could push it along. And uh, uh, when we looked at the output now from bipolar cells, the neurons which drive, uh, provide the excitatory drive to the ganglion cells, Again, we found we could find three basic types of bipolar cell output. Uh, 
So in blue here is shown uh, a, a, a bipolar cell which was relatively indifferent to uh, a temporal contrast. In black here, we can see a bipolar cell where the output is initially strong and then it adapts as a decrease in gain, it desensitizes. And then in red here, we've got a, a bipolar cell which initially responds to the increase in contrast very weakly and then sensitizes. So we can see these opposing forms of plasticity now, not just in the ganglion cells that provide the output from the retina, but also in the bipolar cells that drive them. And uh, what are the mechanisms? What's going on here? Well, it turns out, I'll show you in a moment, the depressing adaptation basically uh, uh, reflects uh, uh, um, a, a decrease in the number of vesicles available for release. It's presynaptic depression uh, uh, as vesicle depletion. The sensitizing adaptation uh, uh, is uh, more subtle and uh, um, what that involves is also synaptic depression, but depression in the inhibitory synapses that control the, out, the gain of the bipolar cell output. So let me show you some evidence for that. Okay, so now again, we're looking at the output from bipolar cells. We're looking at the whole population, but now our reporter is uh, uh, what we call side GCAM. This is a, a calcium reporter that uh, 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 we made by fusing a GCAMP to uh, a vesicle protein synaptophysin. And this allows us to look with much improved signal to noise uh, uh, compared to cytoplasmic GCAMP, specifically at synaptic signals. So uh, you can see on the right here uh, uh, a movie, um, and now we're looking at synaptic changes in calcium uh, in response to uh, 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 steps of light. And again, you can see on and off synapses. Uh, in different uh, layers of the inner retina. Okay, now if you look at these synaptic calcium signals and you compare them in different layers of the inner retina, that's shown here, we can look at the output from bipolar cells and uh, in parallel experiments, not simultaneous parallel experiments, we can also look at the output, the synaptic activity of amacrine cells in the same layers. And what we find is that uh, the different forms of plasticity, sensitization versus desensitization, partition differentially in different layers of the inner retina. So in the most superficial layers, when we uh, uh, provide a high contrast, uh, five hertz full field stimulus in this case, you can see the majority of bipolar cells are sensitizing. They respond weakly, then the response gradually grows. In that same layer, amacrine cells are predominantly uh, uh, desensitizing. They initially respond strongly and then gradually their response declines. Uh, so it's very tempting looking at that correlation to think, well, what's happening here is that the amacrine cells are initially inhibiting the bipolar cell synapse strongly, but then as the amacrine cell depressed, the bipolar cell is released uh, from inhibition. And uh, one piece of evidence supporting that idea comes from directly manipulating inhibitory transmission uh, uh, using picrotoxin. So here's an example where we're plotting the release rate uh, from a population of bipolar cell synapses now. And um, uh, on average in the whole population shown by the black trace, you can see the contribution of the desensitizing bipolar cells and then, whoa, sorry. And then the gradually sensitizing bipolar cells. But now when we block inhibitory transmission with pyrotoxin, the sensitizing component uh, disappears. And we have, uh, as it were, one-way adaptation uh, in the population, uh, uh, straight desensitization. Okay, so um, here's the basic uh, circuitry by which we can uh, explain these two forms of plasticity. Depression in the retinal output uh, reflecting a decrease in excitatory drive from bipolar cells, whilst sensitization, shown in red here, is reflecting the depression in inhibitory inputs from the amacrine cell that control the gain of the bipolar cell synapse. So why? What, why, why would the retina, when we now look at populations of neurons, why would it... Uh, uh, um, um, implement these two opposing gain changes simultaneously in different neurons. Uh, 
And that was looked at beautifully by uh, Steve Bacchus, who uh, uh, demonstrated the basic phenomenology here, uh, opposing forms of uh, uh, contrast adaptation, but looked into uh, uh, how that affected the information that was transmitted out of the retina. And basically what uh, uh, Steve demonstrated was that a mixed population of sensitizing and desensitizing ganglion cells did better at uh, transmitting uh, from the retina information about changes in contrast when those changes in contrast were randomly fluctuating. So in real life, uh, uh, our visual system has to cope with increases in contrast, decreases in contrast, and they're unpredictable. And it turns out that a mixed population of ganglion cells, uh, uh, which, which express these opposing forms of plasticity, do a better job overall than a, a single desensitizing uh, population at signaling both increases and decreases in contrast. So we can basically think of depressing cells as encoding the higher contrast, the strong signals, and then the sense sensitizing cells as being getting ready to encode a, a decrease in contrast should that come along at some point in the unpredictable uh, future. And the basic circuitry I've described here, which we um, uh, analyzed in, in zebrafish, uh, Mike Manukin has uh, recently demonstrated also, the basic ideas are still also operating up to the primate retina. So uh, 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 evolution has uh, held on to this uh, uh, principle of having uh, uh, mixed populations of neurons which adapt to contrast in opposite ways. Okay, so uh, here's an example of how we've been using imaging and reporters of synaptic activity to get into the retinal circuitry to understand the input-output relation, uh, what we kind of generally term uh, computations. And this is an example where uh, uh, we've got adaptation as changes in gain. Um, and what I want to now turn to is uh, adaptations in the retinal circuitry, but which now re uh, reflect not just simply changing how strongly a neuron responds, its gain, but changing uh, what feature of the stimulus it is responding best to. That's to say, it's tuning. Okay. And um, to look at that question, we've been using a better reporter of synaptic activity uh, than sci-fi, uh, intense glue sniffer. So this is a reporter which is based on a bacterial um, uh, 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 glutamate transporter coupled to a circularly permitted GFP. And when it binds glutamate, the fluorescence uh, uh, increases. It was uh, actually initially, the, the first prototype was developed in Roger Chen's lab, but it was much improved in Lauren Luger's lab. Um, and we can target this reporter to different types of neuron uh, in the retina. Um, so shown here are uh, bipolar cells, uh, in Dendrites up here receiving inputs from the photoreceptors, outputs down here in different layers of the uh, inner retina. Whoop. Is there anything going to run here? Okay, so, and here's some examples of the kind of signals we can um, obtain with glue sniffer. So the movie that's running here is showing the dendritic tree of a ganglion cell and uh, we're actually stimulating it with moving bars. And so I hope if you look carefully, you can see synapses on the dendrites being activated in sequence, and you should be able to detect the uh, direction of motion of the bar there. Uh, at the bottom right here, we've got a, a, a very narrow field amacrine cell, uh, almost certainly glycinergic amacrine cell. And I hope you can see hot spots there uh, uh, on its dendritic tree reflecting individual uh, synaptic outputs. So this report is wonderful, very high signal to noise, great temporal resolution, and it's opening up all kinds of questions for us. The question that uh, I'm gonna be looking at uh, next uh, came from experiments with Jamie Johnston, who was a postdoc in the lab at the time. And we asked a very simple question, which is how does the output of a ganglion cell, the signal it delivers uh, uh, to the optic tectum in a zebrafish, how does the output depend 
on the excitatory inputs that it's receiving. So we used glue sniffer to image both the output of a ganglion cell in the um, uh, optic tectum. I think this is labeled the wrong way around. Here's the ganglion cell. <laughs> And here's the output in the optic tectum. Um, and um, in the B here, what we are looking at is a raster plot of the glue sniffer signals uh, delivered from a whole bunch of ganglion cells, just over 100. And the stimulus here is one of them is a moving grating. OK, so classical stimulus. And uh, all we're doing is changing the orientation of the grating from uh, vertical to horizontal, vertical, horizontal. And you can see some of the ganglion cells at the bottom here, for instance, they don't much care about these changes in the orientation of the grating. But many respond particularly strongly just when there's a transition, when the orientation of the grating uh, changes. And that's shown uh, more clearly in C there. So here we're looking at the outputs from a bunch of different ganglion cells. In green are examples of ganglion cells that don't care uh, uh, about orientation, completely untuned. Um, in red here, we've got examples of ganglion cells where the output is sensitive uh, 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 to orientation, but uh, it's so-called statically tuned. So when we go from um, horizontal to vertical, in this example, we've got a small, well, let's, let's use this example. We've got a, a response when we go from vertical to horizontal um, in both cases, uh, but we don't get a response with the uh, transition from horizontal to vertical. And you can contrast that with these examples in black. Uh, these are ganglion cells which generate a response every time the orientation changes. So, yeah, if we look at this guy here, this guy signals. Um, Pardon me. Whoa. Sorry. This guy here is signaling both the vertical to horizontal transition and the horizontal and the opposite one. <laughs> okay. So um, basically, what we, we've got here is a ganglion cell which is, first of all, tuned to respond to the vertical. That response then is snuffed out, it adapts very strongly to that orientation of stimulus, but then it becomes retuned to then uh, uh, signal the transition to the opposite orientation. Okay, so as soon as we uh, uh, saw this, we immediately thought of a, a wonderful paper from Marcus Meister's lab uh, 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 with Hosoya and with Backus, where they demonstrated that the uh, retina of actually a number of species um, could adapt to changes in orientation. That's to say they were ganglion cells that were tuned to orientation, but then dynamically changing their orientation selectivity, dynamically retuning to optimally signal a, a, a different orientation. Okay, so this is, this is a, a form of predictive coding in the sense that the neurons aren't interested in an unchanging stimulus. Uh, they're primarily signaling a change in the stimulus. But not only are they signaling a change in the stimulus, they're retuning so that they can signal changes between different orientations, okay? So-called dynamic predictive tuning. So as soon as we saw these signals at the output of ganglion cells, we thought, okay, well, we're in a position here potentially to try and understand the mechanism that generates dynamic predictive uh, coding of orientation. And, uh, a starting point was a model, actually, that uh, uh, was um, proposed within the same paper. They actually proposed a couple of models. Uh, uh, one, um, uh, uh, we think, is the correct one. And the basic idea was that uh, you could make a ganglion cell that retunes to different orientation selectivities by providing it with inputs from, uh, um, here they're called interneurons, but we're talking about bipolar cells, inputs which are intrinsically tuned to signal different orientations, yeah, but then changing the weighting of these different inputs. So for instance, um, if you apply a vertical stimulus, as shown here, this input will adapt, the gain uh, of that synapse will reduce, uh, 
And the notion is then, should the, um, should the uh, stimulus change to a horizontal orientation, what will happen is that the other input, which has not adapted, will become dominant. And so the ganglion cell will respond again to that transition in orientation. And I'm going to provide evidence that that model is indeed correct. Uh, and uh, I'm also going to show you how it needs to be modified to uh, account for some of the uh, important uh, um, aspects of the dynamics with which uh, adaptation occurs and the dynamics with which the dynamic predictive um, aspect is readjusted. Okay, so what's going on? Right. Okay, so um, the first question is, are there so-called pattern detectors in the retina? Do the inputs from to ganglion cells really encode uh, the orientation uh, uh, of a stimulus? You know, we've, we all know about orientation selectivity in the cortex, you know, from the work of Hubel and Wiesel and so on. And um, Marcus and his group were the first to demonstrate that that kind of computation began already in the retina. Uh, where in the retina does it begin? Um, so what I'm gonna show you is uh, here, direct evidence that it begins in the synapses of bipolar cells. So here again is a raster plot, um, and we're looking at the synaptic activity of a whole, uh, 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 um, we're looking at the synaptic inputs, I should say, to different ganglion cells. So, I hope you can see the pink and blue dashes here. That's showing you uh, uh, different ganglion cells. And um, again, it's the same stimulus. We're transitioning from vertically orientated moving grating to a horizontally orientated uh, drifting grating. And you'll see uh, some of the synaptic inputs, the ganglion cells are indifferent to the changes in orientation. But there are others, uh, such as those here, which are very strongly uh, selective for uh, 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 one orientation over the other. Um, and some of these examples are shown more clearly in grey here. So at the top, at the top here, we've got a ganglion cell that doesn't care about orientation. Um, uh, at the middle here, we've got a ganglion cell, which is select, it, it responds to both orientations, but it's clearly selective to one uh, over the other. Um, here, we've got a third example, which only signals one orientation uh, of the bars. Oh, sorry, I don't have full control over my tools here. Um, okay, so um, if we now compare so we, we, we do indeed have orientation selective bipolar cell outputs. How does that orientation selectivity arise? Um, and we consider two kind of basic mechanisms that might be at work. One, uh, model one shown here, is uh, potentially that the receptive field of the bipolar cells are themselves are, are, are not circularly symmetric, uh, but are skewed such that the bipolar cell output becomes uh, um, selected to the orientation of, of the stimulus. Okay, so that's a, an intrinsic mechanism that would generate an orientation selective output. The second uh, model is one potentially in which uh, the intrinsic receptive field of the bipolar cell is circularly symmetric, but it receives inhibitory inputs uh, uh, which uh, are determined by the orientation of the stimulus. So um, uh, uh, here's an example which, uh, in which the inhibitory input would be activated by a horizontal stimulus, yeah, which would make this uh, bipolar cell output uh, uh, signal vertical stimuli uh, more strongly. Okay, um, and it turns out that it's actually a combination of both these intrinsic mechanism and uh, extrinsic uh, inhibition that uh, accounts for the orientation selectivity in the output of bipolar cells, although to varying degrees. Okay, so uh, how do we get at that? Uh, first of all, we map the receptive fields of uh, individual synapses. Uh, 
Uh, again, our assay for activity is glutamate release measured with glue sniffer. And we reconstructed receptive fields using um, a, uh, uh, we didn't use the kind of classical white noise checkerboard type of stimulus. We used a, an approach based on filtered black projection, which uh, um, uh, we published a few years ago and uh, allows us to use imaging to reconstruct receptive fields much more quickly than um, um, a flickering checkerboard. Um, and it turns out that if you look at the uh, receptive fields of uh, individual synapses, they're very often not circular, they're often elliptical. And here are two examples. And uh, in this histogram, we're looking at the distribution of uh, ellipticity. Um, you know, zero would be a perfectly circular receptive field. Very few are like that. Um, uh, uh, they're all skewed to some extent, basically. But the degree of ellipticity that we measure in the receptive field of the synapses isn't sufficient uh, uh, to account for the degree of orientation selectivity that we measure um, uh, when we compare uh, the outputs to different orientated stimuli. So that's shown in D here. In D here, we're uh, using a linear model to predict the degree of orientation selectivity based on the receptive fields that we've reconstructed. And uh, in red, uh, we're showing the actually observed distribution of orientation selectivities in the output of uh, bipolar cells. And you can see uh, it, the intrinsic uh, mechanism uh, just isn't strong enough to account for how selective bipolar cell outputs are. Okay, so let's go to the second potential mechanism, inhibition. And uh, what we're looking at now, again, is the activity in bipolar cell synapses, but measured using the calcium reporter now. And uh, what we noticed was that in many bipolar cells, uh, they responded not just to their preferred orientation, but they were also inhibited by uh, the orthogonal orientation, immediately telling us that uh, these bipolar cells uh, 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 were being inhibited uh, uh, by uh, interneurons, and that this, this was determining the, the degree to which they became orientation selective. So here are a couple of examples. The orientation selectivity indexes are shown to the right here. In some cases, we can't see the net inhibition, even though they're perfectly orientation selective, but in these top two cases, we can. So to test this idea, we uh, did an obvious experiment. We uh, used pharmacology to uh, 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 block inhibition. And uh, uh, what we find is that this uh, uh, strongly um, affects the uh, 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 distribution of orientation selectivities that we can measure in bipolar cell synapses. So in black are the, is the control distribution. Uh, you can see that the orientation selectivities actually fall into two clumps. There's a, a subset of bipolar cells uh, in which the output is very highly orientation selective. Uh, and that, that subset is completely lost when we uh, inhibit, uh, you know, disrupt inhibition as shown by that red distribution. Um, um, Another way to, to look at the same thing is to look at how the distribution of preferred orientations is altered by uh, this manipulation. Uh, so in, in black here, we show the uh, distribution of preferred orientations between zero and 180 degrees for bipolar cell synapses. In blue is the same experiment where we're looking at amacrine cell synapses. So of course, this is a key substrate here for this mechanism that the inhibition might itself be orientation selective. And you can see the amacrine cells are to, uh, 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 don't signal orientations uh, equally. And again, we lose uh, a large degree of, uh, the distribution of preferred orientations now becomes flat in bipolar cells when we disrupt inhibition. So uh, uh, lateral inhibition, it's not just a question of the pattern detectors that we're talking about to generate this dynamic predictive code reflects a combination of intrinsic um, uh, uh, asymmetric receptive fields and then a contribution of 
uh, inhibitory inputs from amacrine cells that uh, more strongly tunes these pattern generators. Okay, so that's important. How are the pattern generators being generated? Um, but the second uh, uh, key uh, um, kind of um, extra level of detail that we were able able to go into in terms of understanding this form of dynamic predictive coding was in terms of the kinetics. Okay, so let me elaborate on what I mean. So uh, what we're showing here on the right is a um, comparison of um, the output of a ganglion cell in the optic tectum that's shown in black as we switch the orientation of the grating. You can see this is an example which uh, uh, very strongly uh, uh, encodes uh, um, um, both the vertical and horizontal switches in either direction. It's very strongly dynamically retuning. But what we've got in red now are the excitatory inputs, so that same ganglion cell. And what you can see is uh, a, a couple of uh, features. First of all, most importantly, we're looking, first of all, I should say, just to the inputs tuned to the 90 degrees. And although the output from the ganglion cell uh, adapts very rapidly and completely, these inputs uh, only adapt partially and much more slowly. Okay, so there's an important part of uh, understanding this computation, and that's its dynamics. What is causing the net output from the ganglion cell to uh, adapt so much more rapidly and more completely? Okay, and um, it turns out that this is a, a, a feed forward inhibition, that there's a high pass filter operating within the inner retina and that that high pass filter uh, is uh, uh, generated by amacrine cells, which uh, 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 feed forward onto the same dendrites that these excitatory inputs from bipolar cells um, connect to. Um, I'll, just before I show you the evidence for that, let me just tell you what I'm showing you in the middle here. Um, what I'm showing you in the middle here is, an, uh, I'm trying to give you an idea of the variety of different combinations of inputs that different ganglion cells can receive. So what we're showing at the top here, we've got four examples. Uh, here's a, a ganglion cell in which uh, the inputs are just completely selectively tuned um, uh, uh, to the vertical orientation, yeah? Here we've, and the average of all these inputs is shown in gray, okay? And you can see here very clearly uh, also, the time course of adaptation, adaptation is a simple decrease in gain due to presynaptic depression. Here's a ganglion cell in which the inputs are untuned. Um, then the ganglion cells which will uh, dynamically predictively code, uh, according to the pattern generator model, are those that will receive mixed inputs tuned to different orientations. And two different examples are shown at the bottom here. So if we look at E here, you can see different synaptic inputs uh, tuned to different orientations, and the average is shown uh, in gray at the bottom. Uh, you can see that this average of all excitatory inputs, uh, whatever the orientation, uh, is again far removed from the net output shown in black uh, uh, that is delivered to the tectum. Okay, so Let's show you some um, um, uh, how we got to uh, the, the conclusion that feed forward inhibition was the basic mechanism that uh, uh, determined these kinetics. And that was based uh, on modeling. So uh, in a separate set of experiments that Jamie did, uh, uh, he, uh, electrophysiological experiments looking at inputs into ganglion cells in the goldfish retina, uh, we were able to look at the um, kinetics, both of excitatory in inputs to dendrites and inhibitory inputs to dendrites. And uh, what we're showing here in B is uh, experimental, uh, based on experimental measurements, where we're looking at how the kinetics of the net excitation into a ganglion cell varies as a function of the strength of inhibition that it also receives. So in black, 
is um, uh, the input uh, to the model based on the filters that we've measured experimentally. And you can see the stronger the inhibition, the more transient uh, 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 the net uh, excitatory signal and the more complete the adaptation. And so we considered uh, uh, two models, one in which this uh, form of feedforward inhibition um, um, modulated the excitatory inputs of ganglion cells. That's model one shown here. And we compared it with another uh, possibility, which uh, uh, neglected the notion of feedforward inhibition and simply uh, postulated that the, um, there was a thresholding nonlinearity uh, 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 that um, acted on the excitatory uh, signal transmitted from the bipolar cell to the ganglion cell. And uh, an example here from one, one uh, ganglion cell, uh, uh, um, we're comparing the data shown in gray here with the predictions of the model, model one in red and model two uh, in blue. And it turns out that the model that incorporates uh, feedforward inhibition does a much better job of uh, accounting for the dynamics of um, um, uh, the adaptive uh, effect and the extent of the adaptive effect. So uh, putting it all together, <laughs> this is uh, uh, the circuitry that we believe uh, uh, um, can account and explains the data and can also account for uh, uh, the computation, the dynamic changes in orientation selectivity. It's one in which we have bipolar cells in, in which the synapses uh, show orientation selectivity. So here's one uh, uh, tuned to the vertical, here's one tuned to the horizontal. These bipolar cells, this is something we've not di directly tested, but we think it's most likely, these bipolar cells drive amacrine cells that then become orientation selective. We've demonstrated that amacrine cells do indeed become orientation selective. And then by a process of lateral inhibition, uh, the intrinsic tuning of the bipolar cell generated by its receptive field becomes sharper at the synapse at which the amacrine cells act. So uh, that's the orientation tuning, but then in addition to account for uh, the kinetics, uh, we also believe that we have feedforward inhibition from the bipolar cell through uh, an amacrine cell uh, uh, to create a high pass filter. Okay, so um, um, that's an example of plasticity by retuning the output neurons, the ganglion cells. And uh, I try to explain to you what we understand of the synaptic basis of that retuning. What I now wanna get onto is a, a project that's been driven by Sophie Sable in the lab. And uh, this is again, another example of predictive coding and based on dynamic changes in tuning. But now we're talking about one of the most fundamental um, aspects of visual processing, which is the splitting of the signal into on and off channels. And what I want to show you is that, that uh, these on and off channels actually don't run in parallel through bipolar cells, but that uh, uh, bipolar cell synapses, not, not, not uh, can become retuned from on to off. Okay, so that's going to sound a bit crazy. <laughs> Let me show you the evidence. Okay, so um, we're using glue sniffer again. And uh, as I mentioned, I love glue sniffer. Uh, here's an example of a, 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 a bipolar a, a retina. We've got a bunch of bipolar cells and we've got them sparsely labeled. And this is actually important. Sparse labeling allows us to home in on individual synaptic compartments and minimizes background so we can really improve signal to noise and we improve signal to noise also by collecting photons not just through the objective but also through a condenser and if you do these things um, uh, i'm going to show you now a line scan through uh, a synaptic compartment uh, time goes upwards each frame is is uh, we're scanning at a kilohertz 
Each frame here is 100 milliseconds. Okay, nothing much happening here across this line. And now we're stimulating, uh, uh, um, actually that was spontaneous activity. <laughs> uh, yeah, now we're stimulating with uh, uh, actually relatively high contrast stimulus here. And you can see these flashes of light, these are uh, glutamate release. Um, if we now look at the uh, intensity profile across this line as a function of time, that's plotted at the top here, what we can see actually that there are two, uh, uh, two epicenters for these uh, explosions of glutamate release, which uh, uh, we think reflect two different active zones. And um, uh, we can use a, a very simple Gaussian uh, fitting uh, and demixing to these intensity profiles to independently uh, 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 measure the events at these two active zones. So uh, we've got the red active zone at the top here, active zone two, and the black active zone at the bottom here, uh, active zone one. And what you can see are uh, signals of very high resolution. This is a, um, a five hertz uh, 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 stimulus. Uh, actually, it wasn't as high, uh, that was high contrast in the movie. In this example, it's only 20% contrast. And there's a number of things we can see here. Uh, first, we can see when we look at these two active zones from the same synaptic compartment, sometimes they both respond to the same cycle of the stimulus, sometimes they don't. Synapses are noisy. We're looking here at a fundamental property, the stochastic nature of vesicle release. But the other incredibly interesting thing is that the amplitudes of these events varies uh, enormously. And it turns out that the amplitudes of synaptic events changes because of so-called multivesicular release. Okay, so that's the kind of resolution that we can uh, uh, obtain with glue sniffer. Um, and that's why I love it. But let's, let me get back to tuning of synapses between on and off. Here's a simple experiment now where uh, uh, what Sophie did is she scanned her line, not through one synaptic compartment, but through a bunch. So um, here's a bipolar cell. Um, um, and you can see it's got a number of compartments in different layers of the inner retina. And um, um, here I'm showing a, a movie of uh, activity in these different compartments. This is at relatively uh, 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 lower resolution to 100 Hertz. And what I'm plotting here now is the activities in these different synaptic compartments uh, in, in response to a, a step increase in intensity. Actually, the way we did this experiment is we're using a one hertz square wave. And here I'm just looking at the uh, average response to one cycle. You can see this synaptic compartment uh, generates an off response, which is rather transient. This one here releases glutamate both at the on phase when intensity increases and the off phase when intensity decreases. This compartment uh, is a uh, 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 clearly an on uh, an on response, which is, which is you know, it's got a, a transient component as well as a sustained component. And then this last compartment here, again, is purely on with a very large sustained component. So we've got different outputs from one bipolar cell varying in their kinetics and also in their polarity. So here's one example. Um, uh, here's another example now where the axon of the bipolar cell isn't extending through uh, the different layers of the IPL, but is uh, projecting laterally through one layer. And again, we can see in this example, different outputs. We've got an off output in compartment one, um, on output in compartment four and so on. And we actually see this mixture of outputs in, in about 50% actually perhaps closer to 60% of the bipolar cells that we uh, uh, look at, which have more than one uh, recognizable compartment. And so here are just some examples of the different morphologies of the axons in which we can see uh, what we're calling synaptic multiplexing, on and off channels, on and off signals being transmitted through the same neuron multiplexing. Okay, what the hell's going on here? How, how, how can one bipolar cell transmit an on signal through one output and an off signal through another synaptic compartment. 
Let me show you the model and then I'll, I'll show you what it's based on. Okay, so here's the notion. Here we've got a bipolar cell. It's got two different synaptic compartments in different layers of the inner retina. Here's the ganglion cell onto which it's connected. And let's just say this is a bipolar cell which is intrinsically on. Um, okay, so uh, on outputs to both dendrites of the uh, uh, um, ganglion cell. Um, what we believe is happening is that one of these synaptic compartments is receiving inhibitory input from a specific type of amacrine cell, glycinergic amacrine cells. These, these uh, have much narrower receptive fields than GABAergic amacrine cells. So when, when this bipolar cell is excited, so is this amacrine cell and it inhi inhibits this synapse. And what that is doing is activating HCN channels, okay? Hyperpolarizing, hyperpolarization activated cation channels. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with these channels, these are um, uh, 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 distributed in synaptic compartments, uh, primarily in the retina. They're, they're found in photoreceptor synaptic compartments, but they're also an important feature of um, synaptic compartments of bipolar cells. And these channels, are cation selective, uh, but they're open when the membrane hyperpolarizes. So whilst this amacrine cell is active, these channels open. And then when this inhibition is removed, they're still open and you get a rebound excitation, they're cation selective. Okay. And this whole thing is enabled by dopamine. Okay, so that's the model. And let me run through some evidence. Okay, so here's an example where we're uh, uh, looking at the, actually it's the one, at, at the role of um, um, inhibition, okay? So here we've got an axon, here we've got a proximal synaptic compartment, a distal synaptic compartment, and uh, what we're showing here is first of all, the control response of both these compartments in black. You can see these generate both on and off uh, uh, outputs, okay? We uh, inhibit glycinergic inhibition with strychnine and uh, we block the off response, maintaining the on response. So we think this is uh, an intrinsic on bipolar cell in which the GABAergic, in, uh, sorry, the glycinergic inhibition, glycinergic, um, is switching some of the synapses from on to off. You can compare this, and I think this is a really interesting comparison, with the effects of playing around with GABAergic inhibition. If we block GABAergic inhibition with gabazine, you can see the gain is increased. We've got larger responses both to the on and off phases, but it is to both the on and off. We don't have uh, a, a clear uh, uh, um, uh, switch in polarity. So kind of generalizing beyond this, it's looking to us like the glycinergic amacrine cells actually have very little role in gain control. They're not really changing the game. They're switching polarity. Uh, whereas the GABAergic inhibition is involved in basic gain control, that first mode of adaptation I described at the beginning of my talk in, in the context of contrast adaptation. Okay, so that's the role of inhibition. Uh, time, this is really important. Let's look here at how the rebound response varies as a function of duration of the on step. This is a 0.25 second stimulus, 0.5, one second. You can see the longer the uh, light increment lasts, the stronger the rebound response, okay? So, so uh, 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 this again is a, uh, a, a hallmark of uh, 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 um, dynamically uh, predictively coding. You're retuning the synapse as a function of time. It's accumulating information about the present state of luminance and it's becoming retuned now to signal uh, a, a transition in the opposite direction, okay? Um, what are these integrators? How does this integration happen? Uh, the integrators we believe are HCN channels and the, the, the time course of the retuning we believe is primarily reflecting the time course of opening of these channels. So uh, here's an example where we're specifically blocking HCN channels with this blocker ZD7288, okay? And um, 
if we look at the proximal synapse, we can see here that uh, uh, the rebound off response is completely blocked. There's something else changing here as well. In this example, we can see that when the light intensity increased, there's actually also a net inhibition in this synapse, which is also removed. Uh, again, another piece of evidence for, for the model uh, 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 that I proposed at the start. Um, Finally, let me show you how this mechanism can be modulated on a longer time scale. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of the actions going on in the inner retina. And actually, if we go from the inner retina and look at the bipolar cell terminal, these synaptic compartments, I think it's very clear, uh, 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 kind of one of the richest computational elements in the, in the retina. Uh, they integrate signals from different types of inhibitory interneuron. They transform signals because of their intrinsic electrophysiological properties. I didn't, haven't gone into how these terminals can generate calcium spikes, for instance. Uh, but they're also sites of longer term control through neuromodulators. So uh, uh, many bipolar cell terminals, uh, for instance, uh, uh, express dopamine receptors. They actually express, express receptors for a variety of neuromodulators. And uh, one of the channels to which uh, uh, which dopamine receptors can modulate your HCN channels. Basically, they enable um, um, the uh, uh, activity of these channels by increasing cyclic AMP levels. And if we get back to the uh, phenomena that I'm describing here, uh, if we antagonize D1 receptors, um, sorry, activate D1 receptors here in this experiment, we're activating rather than inhibiting, uh, you can see examples of synaptic compartments in which the rebound off response is enabled by the uh, activation of D1 receptors. This, this kind of uh, puts this uh, uh, mechanism uh, in a kind of really interesting context. So uh, um, on the short term, we've got tuning between on and off channels in a sub-second time scale. But then the uh, actions of dopamine is now opening up the possibility that this mechanism can be modulated on longer time scales uh, according to uh, factors such as slower changes in luminance uh, and the circadian cycle, for instance. And actually we have preliminary evidence that their circadian control of the number of on and off synapses active in the uh, uh, zebrafish retina. Kind of more generally, more generally, uh, uh, placing this mechanism under control of dopamine also allows it to be uh, altered by what is kind of vaguely termed internal state, which basically means um, uh, uh, situations in the case of a zebrafish such as hunger. Uh, so for instance, in another study a few years ago, we demonstrated how um, dopaminergic signaling was modulated by olfactory inputs into uh, a, a, in a zebrafish. So here uh, we've got, I think, a, an intrin a, a fundamental mechanism that uh, uh, not only will allow for uh, predictive coding, that's to say, emphasizing changes from a recent stimulus property, uh, but it's also placing that uh, uh, under longer term control. And we can also, I think, think of this as a mechanism that helps overcome the bottleneck in the transmission of visual information uh, uh, imposed by, by the limited number of neurons and synapses. Effectively, what's happening here is we've got all these on bipolar cells, yeah? Uh, they signal when the light goes on. And what the retina is doing is when the light goes off, instead of uh, leaving those on synapses dormant, it's repurposing them. It's saying, hold on, I've got all these synapses not doing anything. I'm gonna switch their tuning so that when the light intensity goes down, they can enhance my ability to signal that change. So um, retuning of synapses, um, this example thereof, uh, 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 it will be really interesting to look at how, how that impacts on net information transmission through the circuitry uh, and the output uh, uh, from ganglion cells. Um, and I think that's one thing that we're gonna have to uh, kind of 
look at uh, in the future. Okay. Um, 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 I've tried to show you different forms of synaptic uh, retinal plasticity, first of all, and the circuit basis of different forms of plasticity. Um, and I've tried to show you how changes in gain uh, uh, enable adaptation and how those changes in gain can operate in different directions. I've tried to show you how individual neurons can be retuned, uh, uh, both uh, by intrinsic uh, uh, mechanisms within synapses causing synaptic depression, but then also by the local circuitry. And finally, I've shown you how new synapses uh, themselves can become retuned and then how these different mechanisms can uh, be put under longer term control uh, of a neuromodulator. Okay, and I mean, I think the final uh, thing I have to conclude with is, uh, you know, I've given you a kind of little smorgasbord here. Um, how do we kind of get these into a coherent overview? Uh, and I think what we're going to have to do in the long term is to understand how these circuit mechanisms ultimately affect behavior the behavioral consequences, potential advantages. But that, of course, will itself uh, 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 depend on the external conditions in which the animal um, is operating. Okay, so finally, let me tell you about the people who are involved in this work. I've got a wonderful uh, uh, group of folk that I work with, and uh, they're shown here. Um, uh, there are two people I particularly want to highlight. Uh, they are Sophie, Helen Sable. So Sophie uh, uncovered um, uh, the synaptic multiplexing through individual bipolar cells, the retuning from one to off. And Jamie, uh, uh, now, he, now he's running his own lab at the University of Leeds and he uh, uh, um, uh, has contributed to a bunch of projects, but particularly to the project looking at dynamically um, retuning ganglion cells to different uh, uh, orientation selectivities. And uh, yep, thank you all very much. Hey, well, oh, thank you, Liam. That was a very nice talk. Um, I'm talking to our audience. If they want to join us, they can just click on the link uh, shared on the on the chat. So they can come and ask question or discuss this topic with us. Um, should I be looking at my YouTube now? Oh, don't worry, I'll do that for you. Oh. So we have a very nice question from Anton, who's asking yeah. if it's possible that the filter back proje projection algorithm artificially generate an elongated or orientated receptive field in case of orientation selectivity cell. Um, you buy it here. So I think uh, it depends on how many for, for people who don't know about this algorithm, it, w w w the, the basic approach is actually is kind of uh, uh, relatively simple. We assume we have a receptive field of a particular size. Um, Maxime, I'm getting some feedback. What do I do? Feedback on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll carry on. So uh, we, we probe, we, there's a, a, a receptive field and we probe it with bars of different orientations. And we look at the response to those bars of different orientation. And just using a linear model, we try to uh, reconstruct the receptive field in which those bars were acting on. And it's certainly true that uh, you need to sample uh, a fair number of different orientations. We, we used eight different orientations um, uh, to reconstruct these receptive fields. And if you used fewer, say four different orientations round the clock, you, you, you might well kind of get dodgy outputs in terms of, uh, but I don't think it's a major concern. I mean, when we looked at the uh, uh, degrees of electricity, um, they, they were pretty uniformly distributed. We didn't kind of, get, uh, say, peaks, which might reflect the eight different orientations that we used, for instance. I, I, I can't think of a reason why. Uh, 
I didn't I didn't see anything to worry about that. Let's put it that way. Fair enough. Um, I have a question from Chelson, which is a bit controversial. Um, what defines the cell subtype within the bipolar cell population? Um, well, that, that would be the glutamate receptor type. So, 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 you know, if you measure signals in the soma with a, with a sharp electrode, uh, you know, there's, there's no, or, or a patch electrode, there's no uh, um, problem. Uh, an on-cell is an on-cell. It's always an on-cell. It doesn't generate off-responses. An off-cell is an off-cell. It doesn't generate on-responses. And that's just reflecting the two different glutamate receptors on their dendrites. The action is happening. The action is happening when the current flows into the synaptic compartments at the end of the axon. And I should say, I perhaps should have said that that this mechanism seems to basically only operate in on bipolar cells. Uh, uh, we can't completely rule out that we might have switching of um, the synapses from an intrinsically off bipolar cell to on, um, but um, uh, we haven't convinced ourselves, so let's put it this way, we haven't convinced ourselves of a, a examples of that. And uh, uh, the vast majority of the ganglion cells, that, uh, bipolar cells that we look at that do the switching are intrinsically on. Um, I got another question from Anton. How general is dynamic predictive coding? Did you try other stimuli like direction of motion or spatial frequency? How general is it? Um, we, uh, um, I guess I don't know. <laughs> Uh, of course, the way to know is to do the kind of experiments that Anton's suggesting. Um, uh, uh, we haven't looked at how, for instance, frequency tuning might change. Um, uh, uh, certainly, there's uh, 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 um, changing in receptive field sizes. I mean, that's a that's a feature of. Uh, adaptation to luminance, but I, I, I also think that uh, uh, I'm trying to pin down the papers now that uh, uh, the distribution of spatial frequencies uh, uh, in a fluctuating stimulus, that that uh, uh, also, perhaps somebody can help me here, uh, also uh, uh, can retune receptive field sizes in ganglion cells. I can't, I, I've got to see the chat. Let me, let me open the chat. Yeah, it's not at all. I mean, if Anton, if you're listening to us, please join. In the meantime, I can ask Marla to join us. She has a couple of questions. I see she's with her on her room. So Marla, if you want to ask yourself your hello. Hi, Marla. <laughs> oh my God, Leanne, it's still dark here. <laughs> oh, thank you, Kevin. Nice to see you, Marla. <laughs> Very nice to see you. Uh, the imaging was spectacular of the single bipolar cell terminals. So um, I had a question on the orientation tuning. If uh, in one of your slides, it looked like uh, when you looked at the distribution of the bipolar cell tuning that there was an over like a dramatic, dramatically more tuned to zero and 180 and very few that were tuned at 90. If I, I might not have seen that plot correctly. Uh, so you Marla, probably, I, I lost you for a moment there, Marla. The, uh, could you just repeat the question? I, I lost you for a second. Sure. That the, is there an over distribution? Uh, are, is there an over representation of horizontal orientation than vertical in yeah. the bipolar cells? And is that also true in the ganglion cells? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, um, so we so when you look in the ganglion cell output, we have these experiments. It's actually pretty small. It's about twenty-seven ganglion cells. But uh, Martin Mayer has uh, much more comprehensively looked at the distribution uh, 
of orientation selectivities in the outputs of ganglion cells uh, in zebrafish. And um, uh, they're actually, the distribution has three peaks, as I recall, Marla. Um, um, yeah, the bipolar, yeah, I was, I'm thinking of the, the one slide cells. you showed of the bipolar cells. Yes, and it the like bipolar there. cells, it seems to be, there are two peaks. Uh, uh, vertical and horizontal. R r ver no, uh, hold on. Let me just let me get the data. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was zero and one eighty, but maybe. Uh, uh, um, can you see my? Are you seeing my screen now? No, yeah. I stop it. You have to reshare it. Okay, I I'll just quickly reshare it, uh, Marla. Uh, share screen. And there, okay. Um, so uh, if we look at the preferred orientations, Marla. Um, yeah. Um, uh, Looks like zero and 180 there. Yes, it's zero and 180. It, it, it's, um, it's vertical. Oh, ver that's vertical. That's vertical, uh -huh. yeah. Okay, so they're prefer, and is that, so is that, but, and very few horizontal then. So is that also true in the ganglion cells? I guess no. that's the question. No. Mm -hmm. No. So, uh, uh, no, in the ganglion cells, uh, as I recall, there are three populations and the, the, the peaks are separated by roughly 120 degrees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I should double check that, but that's what I recall from Martin May's work. So, um, so you're wondering how to get those different. So he did this by measuring calcium signals in the uh, ganglion cell axon. Uh, that's how he surveyed the ganglion cell outputs. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know who might be able to fill in here is Anton. Is Anton still on? <laughs> He's been looking at this. Is enjoying us, yes. Oh, okay. Oh, is this is this the breakout bit? Yes, but you should be warned. We're still being taped. I have made this mistake already. Oh, so. okay. no, no swearing there. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, but that that's a really good question, Marla. How do you how do you create how do you create these different uh, uh, outputs? Um, Oh, okay. Oh, it, must be a, it must be a combination of different degrees of inhibition. Yes, but you guess, be we're still being taped. Someone has to turn off their, uh, yeah. Anyway, all right. You can take other questions. Lovely talk, Leanne. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Marla. Thanks for that. Um, I see that Anna from Tübingen is in the chat, and she had a question for you, if you want to ask it directly. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'm interested in the second part of your talk um, when you talked about uh, the sparsely labeled bipolar cells that were showing both on and off responses in different parts of their kind of axon, yeah. whether you've checked to make sure that the um, signals you're seeing kind of further uh, closer to the somas of these on bipolar cells is not just spillover from the off layer, just having lots of glutamate in it during times when the light is off? Um, uh, so spillover as a component of these signals is something that, you know, we obviously worried about. And uh, there's a few different pieces of evidence that, um, that tell us that these signals are very little affected by spillover. So uh, one of them um, I, I showed in the talk, which is if, for instance, we do a line scan through a single compartment, yeah, uh, what we can find within there are foci, uh, 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 which we believe are individual active zones, uh, 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 which don't always respond in synchrony. You, you that the, the 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 kind of stochastic aspect of transmitter release, you can see by the fact that one of these foci might respond on one trial and the other one won't. And they're, they're often separated just by a couple of microns. So that's one piece of evidence. Um, you know, if we were looking at spillover, 
uh, I don't think you would get nearly that degree of local heterogeneity. Um, um, another piece of evidence is uh, um, if we uh, kill the bipolar cell that we're recording from at the cell body, so we're recording, you know, we record the glucinophis signal in its synaptic compartment, then we use the same layer and blow out its cell body uh, so that the you know, intrinsic activity of that bipolar cell disappears. Uh, so do the signals that we measure. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, which should still be there if those signals were affected to any degree. Well, you know, we should get some kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, um, spillover signal. So uh, I'm not saying spillover doesn't happen, but it, I, I think it must be much too slow or too small to uh, infect what we're measuring on these timescales, at least. Um, yeah. You, you could block the off the uh, off bipolar cell response, right, with kinase receptor antagonists, and see if you still see that. Yeah, that's another. Uh, absolutely, that's another thing we could do. Um, um, you know. Um, I showed other kind of pharmacology manipulations, which block HCN channels, for instance, and uh, how these have differential effects on different compartments of the same uh, bipolar cell. Uh, again, I think that's hard to account for if these signals are strongly affected by um, a spillover. Um, but uh, you know, one of the... Sorry, Anna. Sorry. I was just going to say, presumably, any pharmacology you do affects the whole retinal network. And yeah. so if what you're measuring is an is a signal coming from a neighboring off bipolar cell that's releasing glutamate, and then you're picking it up on your kind of glutamate antenna that you have running through the retina, then yeah. you would manipulate that with any pharmacology that you do. But I think Marla's experiment is a good one because um, that that should abolish the the, any off signals that are coming from directly from off bipolar cells. Yeah, that, that's absolutely uh, uh, yeah uh, a nice experiment and a doable experiment. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, I thought the ablation experiment was pretty good as well. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty good as well. Although I guess I, I don't know. Do you affect the integrity of the eye glue sniffer if you blow out the soma? That's I good. guess. I guess. I don't know. Yes, I mean that. Uh, I don't know. I, I, but you're right. The the, the more evidence or the, or the more angles by which you can test this, the better. But uh, you're right. The K-nate is. Is, uh, is Sophie on? I'm wondering if Sophie. On. I'm sure we did experiments with AP4, um, but I can't remember the results. I'm afraid. Uh, but you're right. So you're particularly worried that there might be um, uh, a form of spillover, which is uh, uh, specifically enhancing off responses, I think. Is that right, Marla? I mean, to kind of put it in a nutshell. Yeah. OK, so perhaps we should um, do the AP4 experiment. Well, I'm sure we've done it, actually. And I can't. I don't want to report it because I can't remember what the traces look like. Um, yeah, either of those would be a great way to show that the on pathway is generating an off response, right? And it's not coming from the off pathway. So AP4 would be great too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It would be easier to just image calcium and then it's not spillover, whatever happens. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's amazing that expressing a calcium indicator is somehow easier than just putting on a drug in an experiment that's already working. People have a very different view of the world. <laughs> uh, so, so there's a bit of a problem with that. I mean, yes, you can do that, Tom. Uh, one thing is that these rebound responses are really very fast. And uh, uh, Sophie has done experiments with is Sophie, are you there? Yeah, I can see you. <laughs> um, hello, Sophie, talk to us. I can't hear you. She's muted. You're muted. <laughs> Hi, Sophie, can you hear us? Yes, now I can hear you, sorry, I just joined. <laughs> so Sophie, with the calcium reporters, 
which you've done some experiments with. Oh, Hello, yeah, just give me, sorry, I have still YouTube running and I hear funny, funny feedback. And you're doing an experiment, I can see. Yeah, I try to. <laughs> <laughs> Multitasking. <laughs> it's not going well, though. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I did some LAP4 experiments, but that has been early days and the results were so diverse. Basically, I couldn't... I wasn't sure if the drug I, cons uh, I injected was strong enough. Um, so I basically what I'm trying to say, I cannot tell you anything about the outcome of these experiments. Um, yeah. Okay, so we should try them again, Sophie, probably. I could, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Leo, this is uh, Wei Li here. Great talk. Hi, hi Wei Li. Uh, hi, quick question. So, uh, uh, HCN channel, at least in the uh, mammalian bipolar cell, they often also express in the dendritic tip. Uh, when you use a ZD to block them, uh, do you worry about the impact uh, on the uh, on the dendritic site? Um, so, I mean, of course, uh, I mean, it, it, it's something that we have to think about. Um, we. And I think uh, probably if we look closely at the traces, there's changes in the kinetics uh, uh, um, of the responses. Um, but the, the effects, at least that I'm reporting here, Whaley, were very kind of uh, uh, qualitatively yes or no. You know, um, uh, the rebound responses were either there or not there. So, um, uh, so I think there's this qualitative change superimposed on more subtle kinetic changes in the responses uh, when they are there. Is that, is that, is that what you mean? That you, you expect changes in the kinetics? Um, I think that that makes sense that uh, uh, if, if there's modulation from the uh, bipolar input side, it will be more global. That's what you said, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I mean, I've got to say, the, one of the experiments that I found kind of most intriguing was when Sophie blocked lysinergic inhibition, uh, which had a very clear qualitative effect of blocking the rebound, whereas playing with GABAergic inhibition had uh, uh, just increased the gain, <laughs> uh, which, I, which I kind of found you know, really intriguing. I hadn't quite kind of thought about the relative roles of GABAergic versus glycinergic inhibition in gain control. Um, and, uh, I guess one, one thing is that the glycinergic ones are vertical usually, right? And the GABAergic ones are horizontal. So many of the GABAergic ones can't connect the on and off layer, which is what you need. Yes. Thanks, Tom. That, that, <laughs> so I hadn't quite thought of it that way. <laughs> But are, you, are they really? Most of the glycinogenic hemocrine cells are quite... Uh, That's sort of the view on the street, but then of course there's species differences and all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you try to measure the receptive fields of different compartments? Are they different? No, Anton, that would be great. Absolutely. It would be really nice to uh, not just compare their kinetics, I mean, uh, but also uh, polarities, but also spatial properties, absolutely. Uh, and that's kind of on our list of things to do, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, I will just finish with uh, one question from Tim Golish, and then after I will close the session so Marla can speak openly. Lovely to see you, Marla. <laughs> oh, no, she's leaving already. Okay. <laughs> so I have one last question from Tim Golish, who's asking, is the retuning of high cell synapses is layer specific and have you looked yet at what ganglion cells are doing, for example, under HCN channel block? Okay, so, okay, so that's, that's a, a really good question. Um, there's an absolute rule, there's an absolute rule in terms of layers, um, and I need to show this, I think I really need to show this. There's an absolute rule uh, uh, when you compare proximal synapses, let's say proximal to the cell body, versus distal synapses. So 
let me show it with this. Uh, it, it, yes, so I, I, I do share again, don't I? Yeah, share screen. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Yeah. Uh, okay, so can people see that? Um, so this is this is this is the. Um, uh, oh no, that, no, that's not a good example. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, okay. So so uh, here's an example. So um, um, we're comparing here the effect of the HCN channel blocker on the synapse that's proximal to the cell body versus the synapse that's distal. And what you can see is that um, uh, the distal synapse generates both on and off responses. Um, the proximal synapse only generates the rebound off response. Um, the HCM channel blocker selectively uh, uh, on the distal synapse blocks the rebound. Um, and this is, this is a kind of general pattern. Um, that's to say that um, uh, uh, we think this mechanism is primarily acting on the synaptic compartments, which are most proximal to the uh, uh, cell body. Does that make sense to people? So, you know, one possibility, one possibility is that the distal synapse is activating that glycinergic amacrine cell, which then feeds back to the proximal synapse. Uh, that that's the route by which the inhibitory signal uh, 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 opens the HCN channels. I, th I think that basically chimes with you're finding that the off, the intrinsically off bipolar cells don't tend to do much in that, in that realm, right? It's always the ons. So the direction of signal flow is basically from up to, from, from the lower IPL to the higher IPL. So from on to off. So, yeah. Yes, that's right, Tom. So, uh, you know, initially we thought this might be a mechanism that could in principle operate in either on or off, but, uh, 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 you know, when you see mixed responses, you have to have a good criteria for, identifying the intrinsic polarity of the, of, of the neuron. Um, and uh, 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 one of the best ways that we found to do that is, is to look at, uh, uh, is, am I still sharing my screen, guys? Uh, no. Oh, sorry. Um, is to look at uh, uh, which response is varying as a function of time, uh, uh, as a function of the duration of the stimulus. So, you know, it, here's an example. Uh, where I'm showing that the rebound response takes time to grow. It, it grows on a sub-second time scale. And uh, on that basis, in this example, we think this is an intrinsic on bipolar cell, which generates a rebound uh, off response. Um, if we just go with that operational definition uh, of the response to stimuli of different durations, we haven't yet found any ex convincing examples of cells in which it's the on phase, it's the on response that is growing as a, a as a function of time. Yeah. So, um, and I think when, when I say no convincing examples, I think that's from a sample of uh, 25 bipolar cells, 23 are clearly show this qualitatively this behavior. Uh, 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 we haven't found any convincing examples where it's the on phase that, that grows as a function of um, the preceding off phase. Um, yeah, so there was one paper uh, in, uh, so basically a rat study where they um, did antibody stainings. Unfortunately, there are no antibodies available for zebra fish, but what they did show, show in, that uh, in on bipolar cells, you can find um, in all subtypes, basically HCN channels, but in just one, do you hear me? Okay. Do you hear me? Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, 
but just uh, one of bipolar cell subtype is labeled uh, with HCN channel antibodies. So they are rare in rats, and I suppose probably the same situation is happening in saprofish. That's interesting. Okay. I, yeah. I guess I guess the other thing is this weird thing that in some species, and zebrafish is included, you've got these bipolar cells that clearly stratify in both traditional on and off layers, right? And you don't really have that as much in, for example, mammals. Um, but if you look at these weird bipolar cells, the ones that stratify all over the place, they tend to be mglua 6 ones, right? So there's this old paper from, from Vicky Conoten, I think, who basically puffed glutamate and, and checked that. So all the long ones are basically actually on cells that happen to grow an off-terminal um, at some point in the evolutionary past. And then I guess mechanisms got invented that turned it into an off-terminal. Um, okay. yeah. That is quite interesting. Uh, thanks everyone. I will just close the session now. For the people who are still listening, I hope to see you in two weeks. And we'll have another talk. Th thanks for organizing, Maxime. Sorry over Anne and thanks all guys, Anna and <laughs> Leon, stay